Okay. So let's go over to Blackboard for a second here. Wrong one. That's the right one. Okay, so <clears throat> we are now getting close to the end of module two, which we're really just gonna end it tonight. And when we come back from break, module three will begin, which where we'll begin talking about correlation and we'll spend the rest of the semester talking about regression analysis. So will be a lot of really cool stuff to do in that. That's one of my favorite topics in analytics because it really kind of gives us the ability to now take a look at existing data sets, but predict what may happen given the parameters that we find in, in regression analysis. So what it really likes, what we really like to do is be able to take in data, run regression, and then predict the future so that we can then model processes basically going forward and get a feel for how those processes are going to behave. So that's very powerful. Um, and we'll, we'll spend the more or less the last half or the last part of the semester um, working on that stuff. So let me just collapse here, put this here. So the assignment that we're gonna do tonight, uh, it's assignment eight, and it's going to be assigned tonight, but it's not going to be due to the 24th, right? So we got break coming up next week. It won't be due to the following uh, class on the 24th. So that gives you plenty of time to work on it. And it also gives you time to catch up on anything that you have to catch up with um, thus far. So let's just take a quick look at week eight. We've got week, week eight. So right now it looks like exam two will be scheduled on the 24th when we come back and it'll be due the 31st. So that isn't active yet, obviously, but that looks like what it's going to be. And it'll only be a module two material. So we'll cordon off um, this exam to be just module two. That will be the end of exams uh, until the final, which will be due, obviously during finals week. And probably what I'll do with that as well is not necessarily hold it the night of class, but hold it and give you, and I'll talk about, talk more about it when we get closer to it, but give you the like similar kind of time frame to work on it. So um, that's the way it's gonna look there. So in this week, we're going to start talking about two sample hypothesis testing, which we've only done uh, one sample so far. So now we're gonna look at two samples and we're gonna look at it from a bunch of different directions. We're gonna look at it from assumed independence independent um, populations of, of processes. And then we're also gonna look at um, dependence as well. So we're gonna take a look at both of these. Um, we'll catch the second half of two, two sample when we come back from break. I'm just gonna cover the first half of it um, actually tonight. Now, one thing I did want to show you, um, I had planned to show you is I put this link out here and let me just open this up. This is a, um, let's close that out. This is a, um, one of many websites or one of many data analytics kinds of services that um, I've used and I kind of recommend. So this is one of them. There's another one that I'll also show you as well. And what this does is gets into some real heavy duty uh, data analytics and very, very specific use cases. This, this is a course, um, it's five hours, 15 videos, 57 exercises, it's pretty big. Um, I'm giving you just this, uh, not, you don't have to do it obviously, it's obviously a, um, um, option for you, but I just wanted to point it out to you that there's um, some really good in-depth training out um, on some of these sites. And again, this is one of them. I have a couple of others where you can really dig into some really great analysis and use cases. Now this one particular 
example is on financial data. So what you're going to do is learn, you're going to learn a number of things. You're going to learn two super important things. One is getting data from local files, which is kind of what we've been doing so far, local files. We create the CSVs, we import them, and we run our analysis, et cetera. And how to grab data from internet sources. So those would be HTTP kinds of requests for data that comes back into your application. So we haven't done those kinds of things yet. They're well more advanced in R than we're going to get in, into in this course, but you'll have enough familiarity and comfort level with R that this would just be sort of a, an extension of learning more about what R can do for you. Um, this talks, if we scroll down, this talks about um, the different functions it's going to use. It over, it's an overview of the course. It looks like there's sort of, there's five modules basically um, to it. It looks pretty cool, actually. Um, you know, it's something to think about when when you, uh, maybe what you do is you sign up for it and then do it when you have time to do it. Probably too busy right now, you know, with the semester going on. But I do want to show you this um, as, a, as a supplement to some of the cool things we can do in R, especially if you're going to further your analysis or further your education in informatics and data analytics. So I wanted to point that out to you. Just like all our other uh, chapters, we have a lecture, we have an assignment, we have our scripts for this. I should be able to get to at least some of these R scripts today. Uh, these R scripts basically are going to model some of the problems that are in the presentation material tonight. So we're going to look at uh, three, actually we're going to look at four different, actually is it four or three? Yeah, we're actually, well we might get to the fourth one, I'm not sure if we'll get to this one or not. Um, but we're definitely going to look at three anyway. One is um, a use case where baby food um, populations are compared. Um, we're going to look at an, a, a lawn care example where the lawn care uh, process for putting together, um, I think it's lawnmowers and a manufacturing process. And then we're going to look at this example of paper towel absorbency uh, example as well. So those are those are going to be kind of our use cases that we're going to we're going to talk about. All right. So let's go back. Yes, question. Uh, I should be able to unmute. Who was it that asked the question of beer? Hey, there, there you go. Hello. Oh, you're on the Hi. phone. Okay. Hi. Sorry about that. Yes, I um, I was on my way to campus and I um, I got the email that we're doing it over Zoom. So I, I didn't have time to just go back and forth, basically. So I'm doing it uh, while I'm at work. Um, but okay. I'm having difficulties with the computer sound. So I think I dialed and I'm, I'm on the... All right. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so... So you can you can listen in, and I'm going to record it, and I'm going to post the recording too. Okay, sounds good. So um, then I'll just watch it after. I'm going to ask any questions either by email or anything. I don't want to keep them to the same then. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'll take questions at the end as well. Um, okay. Yeah, let me let me get through the lecture material first tonight, and I think what I'll do is we should be able to get through that in about an hour or so. And I think what I'll do is I'll open it up to questions. If you have questions on assignments and things like that, it's a little easier to do it um, in class at the beginning than it is to do it on Zoom, but I'll, I'll do it at the end. And you can any, oh, you can sorry, stay and ask you. questions. Sure, absolutely. Oh, good, thank All you. Right. Sure. Okay, so, um, so yeah, there's the, the link for the, for the R a uh, very specialized course in, in financial data analysis. Pretty cool, actually. Um, so let's get talking about the, the lecture material. Let me stop that. I'm going to share this. All right. 
All right, so again, like I said, we were gonna be talking about two sample hypotheses. So far, we've only been doing one and we've been comparing that one to, we've been doing hypothesis tests against some objective that we wanted to try to compare to or, or, or at least test is our process. So we've designed a process, we've designed something and we have some understanding for what we want that objective to be when we've created that process. And now we want to sample it and determine is what we had expected to see coming out of that process what we're seeing. So that's really kind of what we were doing in, in, in one sample hypothesis test. Still valid, still useful, you can do it. You build any process that you want and say this is the objective that I want out of the process, whether it's uh, we saw some problems in our assignment where wait times, we were going to test the wait times. Do we design our our store properly so that we've, we're not made, making our customers wait too long. Um, we saw shelf life of chlorine additives in, in one of our assignments. We saw a um, number of complaints. So we've reconfigured our, our, um, our airport and we um, are hoping that we've improved customer service. We want to see the, the com so to reduce complaints. So we tested that as well. So it, it works for anything. And the idea is Again, when you're in analytics is helping your organization, whatever it is that you're working for, you know, improve itself and understand if what it is doing and designing is improving itself. That's the only way you know. You don't want to wait and wait and wait and wait um, for cu customer complaints and then write them down and say, OK, how, how are we doing on that? You want to test it. So um, da data obviously is key. And once we get our data, then we can begin you know, doing all the analysis that, that we can or we want to do using our tools. So let's take a look. So in the two tests, in the two sample hypothesis testing, we're looking at two independent. So we're testing to see if these are independent population means, meaning there's no interaction between the two. That's really what we're hoping for. Um, that way we get a good, um, a good feel for whether the thing we're trying to test for is actually having an effect. So we're going to see how the manufacturing process, two different uh, manufacturing processes, is one better than the other. We're going to see uh, two brands, we can talk about two brands of paper towels, is one better than the other. All right. So we want to hopefully make sure that there's no interaction between the two so we know if our treatment of it is actually doing what we want it to do. Um, we're going to assume the population standard deviations are known and equal. So meaning we've designed our process in such a way where we know what the variability is in it. And we're going to assume that we know what the variability is and that the variability is the same between the two processes. Otherwise, the test can't really be compared. Right? So you've got to, what you're looking for is, did the treatment of one of the processes have any effect on the variable of interest? That's really, you know, what we're trying to see here. That's important when we're, when we're, when we're trying to make decisions as to whether we, we, what we've done has actually helped us all right, or hurt us in some cases. Um, so we're going to know, and then we're going to we're going to use that, and then we're also going to take a look at unknown population standard deviations, um, where we're going to have to make some assumptions, like we did in the pooled variance test in chat last chapter, chapter or last lecture, the lecture before that, using pooled variance. So we're going to pool the variance based on the on the size of n, and and make determinations, or let the pooled variance be the proxy for the standard deviation, and then we'll test. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight. We might. Uh, if not, we'll get to it next time. And that is testing the population difference between uh, paired and dependent observations. So here's where we're going to look at the pairing of uh, population differences. In other words, is there a difference between the two populations? So that is a very specific kind of use case that we're going to look at. Um, and then we're going to look at a, a little bit more between the dependent and independent samples. So we're going to take a closer look at that as well. All right, <clears throat> so what's an example here? So in comparing the two populations, we want to know whether their means could be equal. So we're investigating whether the distribution of the difference between the means could have a difference or a mean of zero, a zero meaning is there's no difference between the two. So some examples, is there a difference in the mean value of residential real estate sold by male agents versus female agents in South Florida? OK, 
Okay, that's, that might be an example for where we might use this. Is there an increase in production rate after music is piped into a production area? So let's say we decide to try to make our workers more productive, more happy, um, and we decide to pipe music into an area where they're working. And let's see if we, um, if it makes any effect on worker satisfaction. And really it's a hard one to measure if you wanna look at satisfaction, but they wanna know something very specific. You might wanna know something very specific like production rate. Are we getting more done now because of that? All right, so that, that might be an example. So if we're dealing with population means and we know the population standard deviation or, or we're assumed to know it, then we can use the Z test for that, all right? And then again, like all our other tests, assuming a normal distribution and the samples are from independent unrelated populations, all right? So again, we're testing two different things without interaction then obviously the population standard deviations are known, we can use the z-test. So simply the mean of one population minus the mean of the other divided by the known population standard deviation of each of them divided by their respective sample sizes. And then we take the square root of the, of the variance to get the standard deviation, all right? So sigma squared, we take a square root of sigma squared and we get our standard deviation again. A two sample test of of the means of no with a known standard deviation. All right, so x bar minus x one is the difference in the sample means and the square root of the variance, and then dividing it by the square root of the variance. All right, so that's the explanation of this formula right here. Let's take an example. So customers at the food town supermarket have a choice when paying for their groceries. They may check out and pay using the standard cashier or they may use a new fast lane procedure. So self-checkout, we see this stuff all the time, right? Um, obviously we think <laughs> based on what we see in the, in the real world that more likely than not the fast lane is probably faster, um, but that may not be the only driver here. What we're looking for in this example is, is it any faster? All right, we're not looking for, is it cheaper to run than having people on the, on the, on the uh, cashier? In other words, is it cheaper to have cashiers versus these or a combination? That's not the, that's not the analysis. The analysis, is it any faster? All right, so the store manager would like to know if the mean checkout time using the standard checkout method is longer than the fast lane. So longer than the fast lane. So then we had some times measured when the customer enters the line until all, so we, we really set, and this is important, setting exactly what the experiment is. So it's the time measured from when the customer enters the line until all his or her bags are in the cart. All right. so. It is very clear, and again, this is also important when it comes to analytics, exactly what we're measuring and being consistent with that measurement. Not when the cashier has rung up all of the stuff and put it in the bag. It has to be rung up in the bag, in the cart, all right, that kind of thing. So that, which is then a, a similar comparison. So if you use the checkout, your self checkouts, right? You got to do your own work. You got to take your stuff out of your basket, scan it. And if you brought a bag, put it in the bag. All right. So you got to do that for all your merchandise. And then you take it from the, the cart area or the bagging area and put it into your cart. Okay. So we want to, again, it's important to make sure that we're comparing exactly the same kind of process. Otherwise, if you're not, you, you could make erroneous conclusions based on that, all right? So that's, that's an important distinction, making sure our measurement process is exactly the same. Okay, another important analytics point. Okay, so two sets of data here. We had a, um, a standard with the, with the uh, checkout with the cashier, sample size of 50, sample mean of 5.5 minutes, with a population standard deviation of 0.40. Then the fast lane procedure, 100 sampled, 5.30, and a 0.30 population standard deviation. 
if we pop that into the formula, all right, well, let's, let's do our hypothesis first. The null hypothesis is that the mean checkout time is less than or equal to the mean fast lane checkout time. Okay, again, what we're testing here is the new process better or not. So what we're saying here is that our existing checkout time is less than or equal to the mean fast lane checkout time. So in other words, our existing process is equivalent to our new process, or in this case, equivalent or better than the new process. So we have to prove that if we're, if we're looking at putting these fast lanes in, that that is going to make a difference. All right, so our mean checkout time is less than or equal to the fast lane checkout time. So if we're looking at our, our curve, our example curve and where our critical value in our rejection region is, so if H0 is less than or equal to, then HA, the alternative is it's greater than. All right, so we've got to look at where our curve is. Again, standard DV, um, normal distribution, draw our, draw our um, critical line, critical value, and then above that critical value, if our, if our hypothesis is less than or equal to, and then <clears throat> above the critical value is our alternative hypothesis, hypothesis. So let's go, just go back to that for a second. So what we're looking for is, in other words, the difference in of, of 0.20 minutes between the mean checkout time from the standard EV standard method and the mean checkout time is due to chance, in other words. All right, so we're really trying to test to see if that thing doesn't really have any value. Now, we might want to do more than this, more than this testing, but we definitely want to, we want to, we want to test it. We want to be, be proven that there is a difference here. So the alternate hypothesis is the mean checkout time is longer for those who use the standard method. All right, so we've got to prove that the um, that the the fast lane is actually better. All right, so um, we set the mu s to refer to the checkout time for the for the cashier, the standard time, and f mu of f to be the checkout time for the fast lane. So our null hypothesis is that standard the way we do it now is just as good. All right. Alternatively, it's not just as good and that the fast lane, so if we were to reject H0 and take H alternate, that we're saying that the fast lane is better, right? It is, it is a faster way to get our, to our grocery process. So we're gonna use a 0.01. We want a 99% um, confidence level. Right. Determine whether the mean checkout time is longer using the standard method. We set the alternative to indicate the mean checkout time is longer for those using the standard versus the fast lane. All right. Since the rejection region is the upper tail of the standard normal distribution curve, we find the value. Again, if we went to the table, we would do a one tail test with a 0.01 in the T table or, or the Z table or we look at the t-table for the, the one-tail test in the level of significance of 0.01 and the uh, n or the number of samples n plus one, uh, n, n1 plus n2 minus two, or obviously we can just use R script. So either one, we're gonna do R script. All right, so if we're gonna choose one, we wanna choose R to do it for us, we'll end up getting a critical value of 2.326. So the decision rules to reject the null if the value of the test statistic exceeds 2.326. All right, so that's what we're looking for here. That's exactly what the picture looks like. And again, that's, when we do our assignments, we're always gonna to wanna to kind of picture this, right? That's why in these slides, there are these graphs in here for you to go back and refer to. When you set your hypothesis, then you all automatically know which of these curves is representative of your test. All right. So our rejection region is out here. Our fail to reject region is all down in here. So fail to reject the null hypothesis that the standard is at least as good as the fast lane, in which case 
why invest in it if it's not going to help you out? All right, so if we do our analysis, we make the decision. So we did our calculation first and we get a 3.123. All right, so we want to make the decision that after we've done our calculated statistic, um, that's on the next page. So step five is uh, decide calculator statistic 3.123. 3.123 sits outside of our 2.326, so we're going to we're going to reject. All right, so we reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternate that that our standard is as good as our fast lane and our fast lane is indeed better. All right, so it is indeed faster. I shouldn't say better, but faster. All right. So that is same kind of process we're doing in one, in one sample, it's just now we're comparing two separate samples and we're using the means of those two separate samples. All right, that's, that's the key difference. And what we're trying to determine here is one better than the other. So we wanna set our test up or is one different from the other, all right? And in the case of this, we're looking to see if the standard is as is, is good as the fast lane. And it turns out it's not, all right? The fast lane is better. I shouldn't say better, faster. So it, because if you take the next step of that, you present this to management and they go, okay, it is faster, but it's going to cost us $10 million to do this. And I don't want to spend $10 million. So yeah, it may be faster, but I'm not spending 10 million bucks to make my customers get out of the store a little bit faster. So we're not going to do it. Just it is a valid conclusion to be drawn. You did your part in giving them the data and it's up to the, the decision makers at the, at the level of management that would be able to have the purse strings to decide whether or not to invest in that. Okay, so we did our, um, we did our analysis on that. Now, so we can do the p-value so we can calculate the p Again, I prefer to use it. I prefer to use the R script to do that. Um, but what we what we're seeing here and what this is going to explain is based on these statistics or based on these critical values in the T statistic that we find, we're going to actually use the. We're going to need to calculate two things. We're need we're going to need to figure out the half of the curve and look up the, the t value and look at what value is in the t. So if you take a look at b.3, b.3 is the t distribution table or, or the student c distribution. You can't find a probability associated with 3.123. The largest value is 3.09. The area corresponding to 3.09 is 0 0.4990 of the curve. So in this case, the p value is less than 0 0.00. 001 and we subtract that from the half of the curve all right so we conclude that there's very little likelihood that the null hypothesis is true which is what we expected from that anyway i prefer to use the r script because we've got to do gyrations on understanding how to look at the table and then how to look at the critical value versus the value that or, or the the t statistic that we've calculated versus what's in the table i prefer to use the the um the, the um our script for that. Another example, the Gibbs Baby Food Company <clears throat> wishes to compare the weight gain of infants using its brand of baby food versus its competitors. A sample of 40 babies using the Gibbs product revealed a mean weight gain of 7.6 pounds in the first three months after birth. For the Gibbs brand, the population standard deviation of the sample is 2.3 pounds. So we've got the population standard deviation known. Then a sample of 55 babies using the competitor's brand revealed a mean weight increase in weight of 8.1 pounds. The population standard deviation of that competitor's brand is 2.1 or 2.9 pounds. At the 0.05 significance level, can we conclude that the babies using the Gibbs brand gained less weight? All right, 
And we're going to do that same kind of analysis that we did. Now, in a case like this, this is where companies use these kinds of statistics and these kinds of analyses to create marketing campaigns around them. All right. So literally this analysis would probably be used in print ad or um, or even doctor's ads or even social media ads after the statistics and after the science was proven out. All right. So there's a real um, there's a real value here into doing these kinds of things. So what are we what is our null hypothesis here? Well, that the mean of the Gibbs is greater than the competitor. Otherwise, the Gibbs is less than the competitor. All right. If we use the 0.05 significance level, and we know the population standard deviation, and we know the mean of both of these populations, or, or mean of both of these samples, and we know both standard deviation populations, it's a matter of just plugging it right into the formula. 1.65 for our critical value. And okay, in this problem, the, the um, rejection region is pointing to the left. And, and the re, uh, so the critical value is pointing to the left. The rejection region is in the left tail. So here is, so we're looking for a value greater than or equal to the comparison in, in an alternative hypothesis of less than. So the region is in the re, rejection of the lower tail. So minus 1.65. So if let's go back to our hypothesis. Greater than our competitor less than our competitor. So our, our rejection region is less. It's on the other side of the critical value. So alternative says Gibbs is less. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative. All right. So that's how we get the value in determining our critical value. All right. So if we do the analysis there, we get a Z of minus 0 0.93, that minus 0 0.93 is still inside of our, so it's on the other side of our, our critical value, so it's in the do not reject region, all right? So in this particular case, so if we were to do the flip of this, which still should still come out the same, um, would end up being the critical value would be up here, and this, this test statistic would be in here. So the critical value, so if we were to flip that hypothesis, the rejection region would be out here, the critical value would be here. So we would still not reject the H0. So we can go either way with that particular hypothesis, right? Take the B table, so this, that in this example, we're showing the P value being 0.1736. Right, so we've got our um, we've got our, uh, our Z value of 0.3264, or we, we've got our, our statistic of 0.3264 and our Z value of 0.9. We ended up getting it. Um, so let's take our 0 0.936. 0 0.9 is our Z value. Let's come across to the rejection region. And we get a 0.3264, which is for half the curve. 0.3264 minus 0 0.50 gives us a 0.1736. Granted, it is not uh, a, a huge value, right? But we're still failing um, to reject H0 anyway. So again, sometimes we see these p values that kind of are a little bit confounding. And again, a lot of it is driven by the data, where we should see if we're really going to fail to reject. Well, that makes a lot of sense, actually. We're going to fail to reject H0. Why? Because if it was 0 0.05 or lower, we would reject H0. So that does actually make sense. All right, so the 0.1736 is above our, where are we go with it? We were at 0 0.01. Is that correct? Let's see. Whoops. Where is 0 0.01? Oh no, 0.05 significance level. So we used a 0.05 significance level. Anything at 0.05 or below, we would reject H0. Anything above 0.05, we're gonna fail to reject H0, which is what we're doing. And that makes a lot of sense, okay? 
similar to what we were doing in the one, one sample test. Now we're just doing it for two. We're expanding our analysis out to two population samples, two standard deviations, and then two samples of n or n sizes. All right, so very, very straightforward. Let's go take a look at Food Town. Did I do Food Town? Let's take a look. Let's go look at the R scripts. Let's take a look at the R scripts. And if I didn't do Futon, we'll look at Gibbs, because I know I did Gibbs. Yes, we did Gibbs. All right. So let me download Gibbs. So let's, let's go back to the screen share here. All right, so we've got the two sample hypothesis test with the Gibbs baby food. Let's download that one. And looks like we're gonna get to Owen's long care next time and the paper towel example next time. Yeah, and the savings bank, we'll get to that next time. Yeah, so let's take a look at our studio. Share my screen. Our studio cloud. Let's create a new project. Let's call it in class March 10th. Let's look. All right, plenty of time, plenty of projects. All right, let's do a, um, let's, let's first name this March 10th. Let's do a session set working directory to the project directory. And then let's do a upload. All right, so the Gibbs baby food example. The company wishes to compare the weight gains. All right, here is the script. Here is the code for it. So we, we've got our X bar one, X bar two, our sigmas, our N1 and N2. and our calculation for P and our calculation for the T statistics. So let's go and run that. And great, we get a statistic. We get a test statistic of minus, minus 0.936 we get a alpha critical value of minus 1.645. And then we get our P value of 0.174. Um, 
yes, half the curve. 0 0.3, 0 0.325 for the entire curve, both sides. 0.174 for half the curve. So either way, our p-value is above 0 0.05, so we fail to reject H0. So this script right here will do that exact problem. And let's see, is there anything else I want to point out that I No, I think that, that's very straightforward. It takes our formula, applies it to R, calculates our p-value for you, all set, ready to go. This problem, so this script will actually handle problems in the week eight assignment. All right, so that's a pretty simple one, pretty simple one. We don't, again, we're not bringing a data file here. If we had a data file, we literally could read the data file in. Let's say we, let's say we didn't have the summary that you saw in that, that table and we had to do the calculations on it. We would have the, the 40, um, 40 sample value, 40 sample weights, maybe in one file, maybe in, in one file with two different column headings or uh, in two separate files. And we could read those in. We could calculate our own X bar. We know what N is because it would be N row. So the number of rows read, we could actually substitute all of those values in. I think we do that in we haven't done it, if we didn't do it in any of the last scripts, we will be doing that soon where we won't hard code some of these values in here. We'll actually calculate these values and then substitute the variable names and for the values we've calculated and then compute the statistics, just like we kind of did for the frequency distributions as well. All right, so there's that script for the two sample hypothesis test of the lower tail, and it's the Gibbs baby food problem. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, when you calculate the p-value for assignment A, do you put just the p-value or do you also put the like other pr probability half thing? No, all you need to do is just calculate the so you want to subtract the p-value from from half the curve. Okay. Um, you don't need to put the other one in there. Okay, thank you. Yep, you don't need to. This script would definitely work for that. All right, let's take a look at the assignment. Let me download the assignment. And assignment is right here. Where did I put that assignment? Oh, here it is. Okay, so let's download the assignment and we'll take a look at that as well. Pretty straightforward. Again, when we start doing these early, so when we transition typically to a new topic, we kind of ease into that new topic. Um, bring that up in Word. Share my screen. Okay. So this assignment, assignment eight, it's going to have, I think it's only five questions, right? Yes, it is. Okay, good. Um, this one, so I put the, the, uh, at the top of the heading, the, the charts, just for your, your um, reminding, right? So to remind yourself what we're, what we're going after when we do these hypothesis tests and where hopefully to draw the line and to, to know where the rejection regions or where the fail to rejection region is. So the first problem is going to be a pretty simple one. It's like you saw in the in the lecture where you're given n, actually given both ends, you're given the population standard deviation, you're given the samples. So that is a very straightforward application of the two two sample test, the two sample script that we just saw basically using the Gibbs baby food examples. So that's a very straightforward use of the, of the script. Now, 
beginning in, probably think it's beginning in these assignments, if I remember correctly, more and more of these problems will actually have an easier way to get at the data. So what am I saying? So instead of you having to key in the values, because some of those problems had data for you to key in, and those were images of the data, you couldn't copy and paste that data. When you see something like this, a um, basically a table, right, a word table, we can take that, highlight that uh, table selection right there, highlight all that data, control C in Windows, command C in, in the Mac, and go over to Excel and paste that in. So let me just show you that real quick. So I just highlighted all that data. I did control C, you could actually do copy as well. All right, let's go over to Excel. And we're gonna do a new blank workbook and then just control V, Windows, Command V for Mac. And now that data is in here, very simply. All right. So again, part of our data wrangling exercise will be a couple things. One, we want to get rid of parentheses. So take out that and turn these values into just numbers. So we don't want to have dollar signs in that data, all right? And I don't want to have, whoops, any commas. So we're going to format, again, another, another um, data wrangling exercise here. So we're going to turn it into a general number with no decimal points, all right? So a couple things that I did, I removed, actually probably could have done it in one step. So let me undo all of those things. Okay, so I just undid all those. We could come over here, highlight the data. I'm a, again, right click person. So right click on that menu, format cells, general, and no data. That way now we know that R will be able, because what R is doing is it's reading, again, back to our, our uh, early discussions about CSV files. R is treating that comma separated variable, variable file as a, basically a character set. And it's expecting that all of the columns are gonna be separated out by commas. If I were to leave the commas in that data, then it would say, ah, that's a new break for me. So now I've got this data, the 20, I think it was 250 comma, and we treat it as a new column. We don't want that to happen. We want that entire data value to be used and not treated as a, a comma separator, all right? If we were to use this now, we might get into Excel using um, these data sets as an Excel file, the .xls or .xlsx. It's a different read, so it'd be a read.excel, in which case there it's expecting an Excel formatted file, which you could then leave those dollar signs and those commas in there because in an Excel formatted file, that is actually a valid currency number. All right, so again, another data um, exercise or another data um, technique to know that if I were to process a straight Excel file, then I wouldn't have to worry about these commas coming out of the file. So we want to save this as, let's browse it. And CSV, and we're going to call this a 8Q, I think it was 3. And save it just like we did with everything else. Yes, that's fine. And now we've got our now we've got our data file. So we could come back in and 
process our R script. So in the case of this um, data file here with players, player salaries, uh, it talks about sort the players into two groups, all pitchers, relief and acting, and then in all position players. All right, so we've got to do a couple of things with this file. Again, part of our analytics uh, training and exercise. We want to turn these into um, two different kinds of players, a position player and a um, pitcher. All right, so all the pitchers and all the position players. Test the hypothesis that the mean salaries of the pitchers and the position players are equal at the 0 0.01 significance level. And I say here, the data from this table can be copied and pasted into Excel to save the CSV. Be sure to remove the dollar sign in the commas from the data. All right. Um, and I just showed you how to do that. We want to highlight it by clicking on the, the, the select table. So how do we change these from position player to um, pitcher? So let's go back to our Excel file again. And a couple of ways we could do it. We could um, drop out two and get back to Excel. All right, so now we could take and probably the easiest way would be to, to just filter the data. So if we click on data and then filter, we get the ability to choose all or individual pieces of it. So I want to first, let's say, let's just take out the, um, let's take out the pitchers first. So catcher, center field, designated hitter first. We've got relief pitcher and we've got starting pitcher. So we could do that. We could also do pitcher. select that way. So we could do a text filter by typing in pictures, or we can go in and select just the release and the starters. That filters down the list to those. So now we could take and do a, probably the best way to do this to make it simple is to separate into two files. So let's do a for our purposes, let's do a file save as, and we're going to, where did I save it? I saved it in doc, yeah, I saved it in documents. All right, so we're gonna save it as A3 or AQ3 pitchers. Pitch, pitchers. Right, and that's fine. And another technique here would be to take all of these, copy these, because all we did was we filtered the data here. Let's do a, I'm gonna copy all of these over to here and then I'm gonna paste them. Actually, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to copy all of these guys. Copy and paste. I can even bring all of my data. Excel, you should have brought all my data. Andrew Miller, Chase. No, it did not. Why did you not do that? Okay. That is bizarre. Let's delete all of that out of here. Let's do this. Now I'll paste it over. Why is Excel not allowing me to do that? 
Hmm. All right. So we're going to do the exact opposite of that. So we're going <laughs> That's a bizarre thing that Excel is doing right now. So we're going to go in and we're not going to copy this. The way, Oh, there it is. Remove the filter, duh. <laughs> All right, so here is, here's our pictures list. So what we're going to do is take and remove all these guys and bring these guys in. All right, so now I have just my pictures. Okay, so a little bit of a, a data wrangling exercise here. So there's my pictures file. Yes, I'm gonna close that out. So there's my pictures file. Yep, of course. I'm gonna go back to my original file, which I didn't touch, and there's all of my players. And now I want this to be the position players. Okay, so we could do a couple things. We could leave this file as it is, or we could do a new save as and call it A3 or A8 Q3 uh, position. So let's do that. Save as A3, A8 Q3 position. Position, position, not position. All right. Yes. Now, what I want to do is the opposite of what I did before. So I just wanted to pull the pictures out here. I want to I want to get just the position players. So we could do a couple things here. I could highlight again, data, filter. Now, this time, I want to leave just the position players in. So let's do that almost that same kind of thing again. So let's just do pictures, all right? But this time I wanna delete them, all right? And then I'm gonna select all, and now I'm left with position players. Granted, it deletes those out of uh, the certain rows they're in, not a big deal, or we could have copied them and pasted them just like we did the others. So delete, granted, if we were to do this in R, we could write a script that actually did this for us, but that's an advanced script. Okay, so a little bit of data wrangling here. Now we've got our position players. We can turn off our data, and now we can save this as position. So now we've got two files, we've got the position file and we've got the um, players, position and pictures file. So let's save that. All right, so now come back to our problem. So now we've got two separate files we're gonna work with. Sure, why not? Let's go back to our problem. So we did that, we sorted the players into two groups, all pitchers and all position players. So what we have to do, again, you were given um, in, that's actually Q2, not Q3, all right. Um, you were given all of the analysis here. So you were given the means and you were given the standard deviations and you were given the populations here. Here, you are not. All right, so you're not given that here. So what we want to do, and you are not given, you are not given the population standard deviations from, for this, you are not given the population standard deviations for this, particular data set. Now, let me just see. If we can guess at it or oh, let me think here. 
you were not given the pop. So we're assuming they're equal, but you were not given them. So what we're going to do, equal population standard deviations in the pitchers players. Okay. So what the trick here, again, I, I again, this, this, this problem was given, um, it was given this way because there's a lot of work involved, right? So you've got your big data set, you got to separate your data set onto two different uh, piles, so your pitchers and your non-pitchers. So that, that's, that's a two-stepper right there. You're, probably, you're pulling in two different data files. You're going to need to calculate the mean and you're going to need to calculate the standard deviation from both. Now, you weren't given the population standard deviation for this, so you're going to use the standard deviation calculated for that data set as the proxy for the standard deviation. All right, does that make sense? So you're going to come back to this formula. And again, this one's a little, obviously a little more involved. Let's go back and take a look at the formula. It's a little more challenging now that we're into week eight. You are going to come back and either calculate, well, probably the best way to do this one simply before it so you don't get confused is to calculate the variance and then follow the formula for the standard deviation by taking the square root of it so keep the script all right so let me go back to the script Share my screen Oh yeah, I got to go back to our studio. Our studio cloud. Here you're going to do two, you're going to do a couple things. You're going to bring in so you you can still use the script, but you're going to need to bring in both data files. You're going to need to calculate the mean of the salary for the pitchers in the mean of the salary for the position players. You're going to need to calculate the standard deviation of the um, position players and the standard deviation of the pitchers. You're going to then assign them to these variables. All right, so SD, SD is the standard deviation formula for the data set. So SD of the uh, table data, let's call it um, table data dollar sign. So table data one, let's say for your position players or table data position, whatever you want to call it, for your position players, you're going to read that file in. You're going to have a column for salary on both of them. You're going to need to copy or assign the salary column to a data frame. You'll calculate the mean of the data frame, the standard deviation of the data frame, and at the same time, you'll calculate the number of rows you read. Now, you can, I would prefer that you use the n row function to do that. So n row of each. So n row of your, pitch, your pitchers is n1. Um, N row of your position players is N2. You'll have to assign those values. You can calculate this statistic and then let it run for 0 0.01. So this will be 0 0.01. And then the rest of it can be the same. Questions on that? I have a question. Mm -hmm. When you change the script from like 110 to 0 0.1 significance level, what do you like? Because after you like put that, it says 0 0.5 in each tail, but like it's only 0 0.1 in the question. So just like delete that. Or delete oh, it? let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Did I not show you? So what are we asking here? The okay. thing is, yeah so this so this one is an equal not equal right because they don't want to know here the hypothesis is 
less than, so one, one population less than another population. This is, and again, I don't care if you do an equal, not equal, quite honestly, I don't care if you do an equal, not equal, or you do a player or pitcher greater than position or vice versa here. So in other words, I don't care if you do a two tail or a one tail for this one, because we haven't talked mm -hmm. about the two tail yet. That's kind of mm -hmm. why, why this isn't due in a week. It's, it's due in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank All right. you. You're welcome. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. All right. Here, it's a, it's a, it's a um, one tail because greater than or greater than or not greater than. Here it is comparing uh, equal, not equal. So this was a, suppose you're an expert in the fashion industry and wish to gather information to compare the amount earned by models in Liz Claiborne with that of Calvin Klein. Oh, okay, here's a greater than, less than. So this one is the only one that really doesn't specify, it specifies equal so equal not equal but like i said i don't care if you do if you if you if you take a position that one is greater than the other or one is less than the other i don't really care if you want to take a shot at the at the equal not equal it's fine it's just going to be a change to that script and you're going to need to calculate half of the p value all right but um the so that so the so you're talking about that middle two-tailed test versus the one-tailed test. It doesn't change the formula, but it does change the p-value. And now your critical values are the minus and the plus because the middle is the do not reject region. The sides are the rejection region. So again, like I said, you go, you can go either way with this one. If you can do, if you want to go for the uh, equal, not equal, two tail, go for it. If not, you can take a position on one being less than or greater than the other. This one is involved, right? So you, you, you're doing two things. You're figuring out, first of all, the hypothesis test, number one. And number two, you are having to write a little bit more in the script because now you're dealing with two different data files. And the reason why I would say two different data files for this one is because you've got an unequal number of players. So your ends are different sizes. You could do it in both, but it's, it's going to be easier for you to understand. And I think it's easier to code it if you, if you separate the two CSVs out because one, one will be greater than, you know, one will have more than the other. This one's a this one's a challenging one. That's you know, was it kind of meant to be that way? This one, let's see. Yep, you got more data. So here <laughs> now we've got a different kind of challenge. So let me let me show you this challenge. You're given data, you're given two two sets of data. You're given an audit um, data set and you're given a sales data set. So they want to know if the daily travel expenses of the sales staff and the audits. Okay, what do they want to know? Oh, mean daily expenses are greater for the sales staff than the audit staff. Okay, so uh, greater than or equal to, so the mu of sales greater than or equal to mu of sales. Uh, mu, mu of audit. So mu of sales greater than or equal to mu of audit. The data challenge here is that you're given this data in horizontal format. So let's go and see how we can wrangle that data into something more easy, easily read as columns. So I'm going to copy that data and I'm going to come over to Excel. All right. And there's Excel. And we're going to do another file new blank. Now I'm going to paste that data in. So control V on the windows, command V on um, Mac. Notice that it is in row or, or horizontal format. An easy way to fix this is to do 
a copy paste pivot. So I highlight all the data. I copy it. And then I drop my cursor down below it. Again, this will, this will be a couple of steps. I right click in Excel. And it has an option. Excel has an option right here to transpose that data. A quick and easy way to get that data from horizontal to vertical. Easy. Delete this. Done. All right. So we'll paste, copy it, and paste it. It'll end up being horizontal. Let's just undo that. Do it one more time. So copy all that data. Right click, paste options. We're going to come and choose the transpose option. Delete. data wrangling exercises you're going to learn and then we're going to get rid of this extra garbage again data clean data cleansing a super important requirement in data analytics and now i've got my data file i can do i can again if you want you can split it up into um two separate files. So you can do a sales CSV and an audit CSV. So you can basically just do save it once and then do a save as again and then, <coughs> excuse me, delete one column from one and the other column from the other. And you'll have two separate CSVs. All right. Or you could read it in as one. All right. So there was the challenge to that problem. All right, so that's a little more of a challenging exercise. The rest of it's pretty straightforward. All right, and same with four. So here, you have yet a little bit more of a different challenge. We get no heading on the data. So, Again, we can copy all of that data and paste it in and then trans, transform, or transpose it, all right? Okay, take it from horizontal to vertical and then put a column heading of Claiborne on it and then do the same with Klein, all right? And here, Claiborne models earn more. So it'll be a H0 is mu Claiborne greater than mu Klein. Right, and then here is a very easy one. Problem most closely resembles the food town lecture, an easier one. So a, a few challenge exercises in here with data. Okay, they weren't meant to be that way so that you could get some practice wrangling your data and getting it prepared for um, processing. And quite honestly, R is really good at that. And a lot of times you may process large, large data sets where you can't do that very simply. So you write more code for R to do that. All right. In a case like this, it's pretty easy because we would, if we were to do a, a data set like this, or let's say a larger data set like this, it's too hard. Although this was this wouldn't be that hard because it's only one column to take out and reformat the dollar signs. We could easily read it in as Excel instead of CSV, in which case the salary column would already be understood to be a a a, uh, a dollar figure or a number, and we wouldn't have to worry about the commas in it being a uh, a misinterpretation of a new column. Of data. All right. So if we read it in as a, as a, as a, as an Excel, I may do a couple of scripts a little bit later on in the semester where we're using the Excel read method versus the CSV read method. So you can see that here. This one's a little different in that you would write have to write a code. You would have to write some code to read the entire line of data, and it wouldn't be a CSV file anymore. 
and then you would parse across all of that data to pull the individual values out. More coding, but no matter what software you would use, you would have to write some code anyway to do that because all of these values in here are not easily delimited or separated out. Again, it was done this way to, to make a point. They're not, com they're not comma separated, they're not tab separated, they're not separated by anything that is, is identifiable. So you would have to literally write some code to, because you don't know where the numbers begin and the numbers end. So you would have to literally write some code to see where, so in, in a case like this, if we were to save this off as an Excel, it'd be fine. It'd be in a, in a, in a cell, that'd be okay. If it was in a CSV on the other hand, and it wasn't delimited, we'd have to either have spaces in between these numbers, in which case we would read until we found a space. So we'd, you you'd literally have to read a character at a time until you've found a space. And then you would store off each of those characters as you read them. And as soon as you hit the space, you know you've just read a number. Again, it's a coding thing. You won't have to do that here in, in this class for sure. But if you do take a class like a Python class or um, you know, an advanced R class or even a, a C sharp or any of the programming classes, you'll get an exercise like that where you're, you're going to be given a data set and you've got to figure out what the data set is. All right, we're not going to have to do that in here. Here, I believe this, this file, uh, that one might have tabs as, as uh, delimiters in it because it's in a table with with um, borders around it. It may have tabs as a delimiter, in which case it's fine. But again, you transpose that data. All right. Nice challenging exercise for two weeks. So this isn't due for a couple of weeks. And um, if you do have trouble with it, um, we can review it at next class on the 24th if you have trouble dealing with these data files or if you do get it, uh, start working on it before that and you can't get it, certainly send me your file and your script and I'll see if I can help you with it. But it's a good exercise. That's kind of why it's in here is to get used to doing some data wrangling and, and getting it to a format. All right, that takes care of the material. That takes care of the assignment. Normally, if we were in class, we'd have had a break by now, but we're, we're going to go right through. I think that's all I wanted to cover tonight. So what I'll do <clears throat> is I will end the recording and then I'll stick around for questions on assignments or questions on, on any of this stuff. This will probably be ready about an hour, maybe, and I'll upload it to the lecture so that we can, you can review it and you can see those data techniques, those data wrangling techniques that I showed you while we were recording. All right, so I'm going to stop my recording.